objectives, what to ask about from your patients, what to look for, where to look for it, and what it all means. Very simple. Screening by dentists for obstructive sleep apnea. The diagnosis is determined by a polysomnograph and it must be confirmed by a physician. It's not that we're not smart enough, it's that's the law under which we practice. And so we're going to talk about an introduction of sleep disordered breathing and we're going to define it. We're going to talk about parameters that it's possible to measure and we're going to evaluate treatment outcome and understand, try and understand the results. Dentists can make the diagnosis within the scope of their license. Uh, the sleep disorders that we could see, there's a lot of them. Obstructive sleep apnea is what we're involved with. It could be narcolepsy, it could be insomnia. Rick did a nice job of mentioning REM behavior disorder. And for REM behavior disorder, you're going to need a full polysomnograph. But they're going to tell you, say, well, I bumped my head, I fell out of bed, I was, you know, put my head through a window, I put a fist through my wife's jaw. Whatever they happen to tell you, it's, it's, you're not going to suspect obstructive sleep apnea. Idiopathic hypersomnia, it's like narcolepsy that they can't diagnose as narcolepsy. And so uh, periodic limb movement disorder and restless leg syndrome. A lot of times patients' chief complaint is to kick in bed or they got restless legs. They feel creepy crawlies in the window when they go, lie down to go to bed and uh, it's very difficult to fall asleep. So, okay. Signs and symptoms, again, unrefreshing sleep, they'll tell you about. They'll tell you about restless sleep. They'll tell you they snore. Excessive daytime sleepiness. We talked, that's the Epworth scale. It's, very, it's really a good scale. I would put it in as your armamentarium. A lot of people use the Berlin scale. Not that they were, they were I think they did it because uh, the medical group that tried to evolve this was in Berlin and the meeting was in Berlin at the time. So then we have witness apnea. So you ever see your bed partner, or have, you, have your bed partner ever reported to you that you woke up gasping or choking? And so, okay, that's witness apnea. And then we have fragmented sleep. We asked Jan, how many times a night do you wake up? And then the other question is, do you have difficulty concentrating? Okay, you can't ask a kid, a five years old, do you have difficulty concentrating? They call that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And a lot of times, these kids are just plain sleepy. And so kids respond differently than adults. So many of you have kids, I'm hoping and assuming. And so you, let's visualize this situation. We've been there. You got your kid at the zoo. You got your kid at Disneyland. You've been there since 9 in the morning. It's 7 o'clock at night, and you're dragging. You're saying, okay, kids. We're going home now. We've had a nice full day. No, 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 I don't want to go home. I'm having a good time. I'm not tired. And, and you know when you see, we're going home in five minutes. And then they start acting out. I'm not going home. I'm going to lay down. It's kicking them. That's, that kid is tired. You know it. But they don't express it. Oh, Dad, Mom, you know, I'm really tired. It's time to take me home. That's not what happens. They're having a good time, and so they act out. And that's okay. It's inappropriate behavior. And all of a sudden, they get all these diagnoses. But really, uh, they're sleepy, and, and you know it and they know it, but, uh, but this is a diagnosis. It's easier for a school teacher who doesn't like a kid to say, hey, this kid's got ADHD, get him to a psych and get him on Ritalin or get him on meds to cut this out because it makes my life easier to deal with behavior, behave, well-behaved kids than it is to deal with these kids who act out. And so we see a lot of this, and a lot of these kids are on medication they don't need to be on. They need to have their sleep problem dealt with. And dealing with the sleep problem makes them smarter. It makes them happier and it makes them healthier. The putting them on drugs, um, not such a good answer, but it's sometimes what happens. And so signs and symptoms again, decreased sex drive, morning headaches because they've been grinding and clenching all night, or maybe they're hypoxic. And then recent unexplained weight gain. This happens very, very, that's why we ask the question, have you had a recent weight gain, and it's, it's very when you have apnea, your metabolism level goes down, your energy level, you're sleepy, you don't do as much, you don't exercise as much, and you gain weight. And so that's and then the other one is daytime dozing, and we have particular problems with these. A lot of times you get the referral from the patients, and they're on disability. Why? Because I had an accident driving, and I was a bus driver. And so, have you ever seen a bus driver that didn't meet the morphometric profile of the apnea patient? 
So, okay, and there's a huge issue now with truck drivers. There's going to be a, a, a huge market coming up because the National Transportation Safety Board in this country is now saying that because of their morphometric profile truck drivers, that the apnea rate is something like 25 to 40 percent, whereas we're saying, well, 40 percent of patients snore, and only 5 percent, according to the epidemiological studies in the dental literature, the medical literature, have sleep apnea. They're saying that 25 to 40 percent of truck drivers have it. Well, that's pretty serious. You know, if you have an accident as a fender bender, and the same thing involves a truck, you got deaths, and you got billions of dollars, or at least multi-millions of dollars worth of accidents. The trucking companies really can't afford this. The companies, the world can't afford this, and we can't afford the death and damage. But what happens is there's two groups of truckers. There's the independent truckers, and there's the trucking companies. The independent truckers, these guys that contract their own truck for the load, and these guys, they're self-employed, and the average earning is something like 40, 45,000. They can't afford $3,000 for deluxe sleep apnea appliance. They're looking for a quick fix. CPAP is difficult in a truck because if you have these long distance haulers, they can't, the, most of the CPAPs are, are uh, alternating current and a truck's got a battery with a direct current. They have to buy their apnea device in the Netherlands because I guess you got direct current if I'm not mistaken. But the point is they have to get special adapters. And then they plug it in on the truck, let's say. Well, the truck battery, the truck's operating on a battery, the battery will wear out. So they're not allowed to idle. There's a huge penalty for idling because they're polluting the environment. So they're not allowed to idle the truck and they have to have the, a the, the AC current and then they have to carry this thing around with them. And so they're, they're, the, the position of the independent truckers is, it's not our problem, we don't have this problem. And, and you're making too much out of this and you're, you're, you're um, oppressing us and, and you're persecuting us. And the, on the other hand, you have the trucking companies who are just being staggered by the huge insurance, the huge judgments against them, and the huge increasing rates for insurance coverage, and they're saying, please, treat all my patients, get rid of the apnea. It's a hell of a lot cheaper to treat the apnea than it is to deal with these accidents. So we have a problem here of diverging points of view between the independent truckers and the trucking companies, but then there's the National Transportation Safety Board saying, well, you have to, uh, we're going to legislate this, we're going to regulate this. And on the other hand, here's the truckers are still a strong lobby, but the fact is you've got powerful interests like ResMed and Respironics who are trying to sell a CPAP to every truck driver. And so what happens is these guys um, uh, um, donated, they, they financed a white paper study by ACS, a division of Xerox, where they established a very credible 50-page report to demonstrate how pervasive the problem of apnea is and the consequences of it in a very professional way. And they laid this in front of the committee, and the committee's going, whoa, we have nothing to counter this kind of evidence. If you read the paper, you go, this is really BS. But nevertheless, there's a lot of action going on there and this is going to open up very shortly to be a, a huge market. And so be ready because you're going to have to see, you're going to deal with these patients. And if it's truckers today, how far are we from getting air, airplane pilots next? Because nobody wants, and you see a story every day about a pilot falling asleep in the airplane or take, landing in the wrong city. And so we got pilots and then bus drivers and then taxi drivers. So anybody that professionally drives for a living is going to be susceptible to testing. Now let me tell you something, they're not all going to go to sleep centers, the world can't afford it. They're going to come, be coming to us and people like us, auxiliaries or independent sleep centers, home sleep testing units to do this. And so there's a, there's a, there's a huge future uh, financially that's about to open up in this field. Okay, let's deal with the morbid consequences of obstructive sleep apnea. Reduced blood oxygen level. And what happened here? I had a, here it is. So this is a pulse oximeter we keep in the office. And um, so if 
you put this on your finger, you push the button, it goes on and tells you what your blood oxygen is. And so it's a very nice tool. Good, good, good. I'm not sleeping. My blood oxygen looks like this um, pulse oximeter, 98. Just hit 100. That's pretty good. So if you want to pass it, you can test that, and you can see where your, what your blood oxygen is. But this is important. This is important. Because you're going to see, one of the things you will see when these studies come back, when they're sleeping, you're going to see a lot of, well, he showed you yesterday. He said they would call a code blue if these people were in a the hospital. They would, in intensive care, they would be getting resuscitated for what's happening in a normal night's sleep. So, okay, these patients are sleeping and they're having these apneas. And when they're having these apneas, um, their uh, uh, blood oxygen is way low. And so the body metabolism is down. But the other thing is, does that mean that these people are having low blood oxygen during the day? Yes. You sit the patient down, do an exam, and take this. You'd be surprised how many people's blood oxygen is below 95. This is interesting to know. This, that's your screening. Man. Maybe say, oh, look at that, 95. Do you snore? Yeah, I snore. No, I don't snore, whatever. But the point is, this, this thing is like 20 bucks on Amazon. So why not? Why not? Okay, so reduce blood oxygen level, increase carbon dioxide level. It's actually decreased carbon dioxide level. I'll have to make that note. Acidosis, uh, alkalosis, nocturia. Again, nocturia. So when you have low carbon dioxide and you have smooth muscle spasm and your bladder contracts, you feel like you got to pee. So you get up to pee in the middle of the night. So you ask these patients, how many times do you get up to pee? Oh, four or five times. Oh, wait a second. I have hypocapnia, low blood oxygen, you snore, and I'm ready, you're on to the history. And so this stuff is very interesting. Frequent sleep arousals, hypertension. When they're not breathing, they're trying, their bodies are trying harder to pump that oxygen, and so you have hypertension. And you have depression, and you have increased risk for diabetes, type 2 diabetes and increased risk of heart attack. These patients who have uh, obstructive sleep apnea have five times the risk of heart attack or stroke, and they have increased risk of motor vehicle accidents. This is not something you want to leave untreated when you, you have the possibility of very benignly, non-invasively, and painlessly treating these conditions. Okay, what are the predisposing factors? And again, they're simply predisposing factors Maybe there's a low correlation, but they all don't correlate. Remember, it's only a PSG. But here's what we see. Middle age, overweight or obese, male gender, ethnicity, usually they're blacks, Latinos. And it's interesting because within this ethnicity, uh, people uh, uh, from Far East Asians um, actually don't have a higher rate. But when they have it, they suffer more. The, the symptoms are way worse. And so it's, it, it's far more serious. And, and so when you have this in, in again, black, blacks and Latinos have it more, but um, we'll call them Asians, have it um, more severely when they have it. <clears throat> they have reduced airway dimensions. A lot of them smoke, and a lot of them um, excessive alcohol use. And then a lot of them are using hypnotics and sedatives. And so it's almost self-defeating because you ask these patients, they say, I can't sleep, so I take blah, blah, blah to sleep. I take Ambien to sleep. Well, Ambien is not a respiratory depressant, but, but you've got to look. That's why we said Gloria looks up all the drugs they're on because you'd be surprised how many of these are respir composine, uh, are respiratory depressors. And so, you, wait a minute, this is almost self-defeating. You want to keep them breathing at night, but they're on respiratory depressants? Hmm. Okay, and, and, and it, this is all interesting stuff. It's, it's, it's easier to make them an oral appliance than it is to get these physicians to take them off the drugs a lot of times. But, hey, uh, you got to do what you got to do and what you can. So hypothyroid, a lot of these patients are hypothyroids, and a lot of, a lot of them are supine sleepers. Okay, and a dentist may only treat a patient for obstructive sleep apnea using an oral appliance if 
They're referred by an MD qualified to make the diagnosis. They're CPAP intolerant. The patient specifically refused the CPAP. And, and again, dentists have virtually no basis to rule out a patient in any of these categories. And so when you get these referrals, try not to rule them out. Okay, by doing a superlative screening exam that we're capable of doing, you acknowledge yourself as an outstanding clinician. You recognize that obstructive sleep apnea is more complex a problem than just lowering the AHI. No one can say that your omission resulted in harm to the patient. You can evaluate the effects of treatment on the whole person. We're talking about Lee and Mike uh, being active directors on the uh, Academy of Oral Systemic Health. This is the way we're, we're really this is what we all are, are about. But they just declare it uh, as being as important as they believe it is, which is primo. Uh, you help your patient to achieve excellent systemic health, and you establish yourself as a referrer. The more you're seeing, the more you're going to refer. And so it changes the whole thing. Typically, you go to an AADSM meeting, and the docs are at this meeting, and they go home, and they make a phone call. They call three sleep centers. Can I come and talk to you? Sure. And say, okay, I'd like you to send me your sleep patients. Well, probably they're about the 10th dentist that's done this. And this guy's thinking to himself anyway, these oral appliances are no damn good. And then they, they own the DME, so they only make money on this. It's very competitive. The government insurance regulates the rates for the PSG. They're not making their money on the PSG. They're making their money by selling the CPAPs. So 98% of the patients that get the referral from these guys are going to walk out with a CPAP. But on the other hand, there's other referral sources. But when you are the referrer, the impetus changes. So you say, well, I'm going to send you back to your primary. Who's your primary? I'm going to call the guy up. I'm going to give him one of Lee Osler's books. I'm going to tell him how good I am. I want to work with the guy. Fine. With the sleep center, it's, it, these guys typically have an attitude that's malignant because they want to do the testing. So they don't really care. It's not important to them that you do a metabite baseline study. When you put the appliance in the mouth, they want to get them back for the testing. So they get them back three weeks later, and they test. They say, this thing isn't working so hot. Go back and get it adjusted. They go back and get it adjusted, and they do a couple of turns. They say, now they want them back again for the next test. And so in their perfect world, they would test, you know, half a dozen times. Well, each test is going to run between seven and $1,500, maybe more. And so the patients are going to get impatient with this kind of testing. They want what we have to offer. They want to go take this thing home, sleep in their home. They don't want to have to go to a sleep center and sleep. And so they want the comfort, the convenience. They don't mind. I've had, again, I had patients, one patient, we worked hard with her. Twelve times we did studies. She's very grateful, appreciative, and becomes a referrer. The point is when you go to the sleep center and the guy says, oh, okay, and the patient doesn't come back for that third or fourth follow-up study, then they say, ah, oh, these appliances aren't any good. I don't, I don't really think, I want to give them a CPAP and get this thing done. CPAP is the gold standard. CPAP works. If you turn the pressure high enough in a one-night study and you Velcro the head shut, it's going to work. So they think, I got the keys to the kingdom. I, I know I can cure the problem. The patient could take it home, stick it under the bed, and not use it. That's, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference to them. And so we have a different approach. We say, well, we've got to work with people. We want the appliance in the mouth. We want them comfortable. We want them sleeping. We want them breathing better. And we're willing to spend the face time with them, and we'll work on all these other contingencies. So we offer a way more complex thing. The average uh, face time they get with their physician is five minutes. The average face time they get with us is like half hour with a cleaning or, or, or 10 minutes for an exam. They get multiples by two and three times the amount of coverage that they get in the medical, the face time that they get in a, in, a, in a medical office. And they're appreciative of that. That's why the six month recalls work. That's why they come back to us. That's why they trust us. And so we, 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 we repay that with that extra effort that dentists are capable of making here. But the point is, when you're the referrer because you're doing all this stuff, they're obligated to send them back to you. Or if you call the guy and you say, hey, listen, I just sent this to uh, uh, Med Brabon's uh, medical advisor, and here's a report from a physician in my area, says that they have diagnosis of apnea. 
Can I do this? Yes. Because eventually you're going to say, listen, they need CPAP. Um, and so <clears throat> it's all about us being the referrers rather than begging the crumbs off of their table and playing by their rules. Could I ask a quick question? Yes, you Do can. you ever have anyone go off medication, um, sleep better? I have patients that say, I can't sleep now. I'm never going to be able to sleep with something in my mouth. I mean, they does it, can't sleep with something in their mouth? They, they say they have sleep issues to begin with. They're taking the Ambien to get to sleep, and they don't, even, they don't want to try anything in their mouth. They say, I, that'll never work. So do, do you get off medication? I don't take them off medications. I would work with the physician too. But typically, um, I have had patients who um, they need Ambien to get to bed, and so I make them an appliance, and they stay on the Ambien. I mean, they're afraid to get off the Ambien, even though I could say to them, look at your AHI went from 35 to 4, and you don't have apnea anymore. They're, but okay, but I won't sleep. I, I, they, in other words, they're afraid. They're, there's a certain drug dependence. So I, I don't mess with that. I just let them stay on it if they want. I mean, again, I'm not the primary. I'm the dentist. So, but the idea, yeah, you're going to have patients who will refuse the appliance. I'm a gagger. I can't put anything in my mouth. So what can you do? I don't, I, I, what I, here's what I don't do. I don't give them a money back trial, guaranteed trial. If it doesn't work, I'll give you your money back. No, no, I don't do that. So I'll do my best. I'll work with you. And again, um, I, I, you ever have a patient uh, gag in the chair? So my ethological study on patients gagging in the chair is they're gagging in the chair because they're mouth breathers and the water's building up and they need to breathe. So they gag. It's a gag is a, is a reflex response to having the nose that doesn't work and water building up in the throat. So here's the Moses theory. I put a breather right on the nose of a gagger in the dental chair. If I see a patient gagging in the dental chair, stick a breather right on the nose. So way back when I was a kid, I decided that it would be the culminating event in my career if I could get an article in the ADA journal. So one day I saw that they had clinical tips, and I sent that idea in as a clinical tip. And they so the, listen to this, the ADA journal sent the clinical tip to the referees. So the refer, I got three referee statements as a result of my clinical tip. And one of the referees said, if you really want legitimacy to this tip, which we're going to put in, we think it's a neat tip, uh, you ought to do a study. So I said, thought to myself, yeah, I'll do the study. So they published the clinical tip. And um, should I tell them the story? I put a picture of a breather right on the nose. And it was, <laughs> it was Karen's nose. And so the referee sent it back. They said, we can't publish. That nose has too much hair on it. So I went and I found a patient who had no hair on their nose, big, nice, shiny nose, and we sent it back in and I put it in. It was an associate of mine, actually. But the funny thing was, anyway, so they, so they published that and I did a study. And the study was interesting because it's, it, it's, it, it didn't, the data didn't show what I thought it would. So what the data did show which got published as a paper, a scientific paper finally, was that if a patient comes in the dental office and you put a breathe right on the nose, it is expected that they will leave the office with a higher blood oxygen than they walked in. If a patient comes in and you don't, it is to be expected that at the end of a dental procedure, even if it's a cleaning or an all-day crown and bridge procedure, they will walk out with a lower blood oxygen than they walked in. So does that mean we have to use, uh, um, that was the next the letter to the editor, does that mean we have to use a breathe right on every patient? No, because just because they walked out with a lower doesn't mean they're in danger of, like I didn't know about sleep apnea in those days, does that mean that they're you know, code blue when they walk out of the, no, it's not that it's serious. It's not, it was statistically significant difference, but it wasn't clinically significant enough that they should all walk, you know, you should put a breathe right on every single patient. But it did. And so 
It's amazing sometimes what you can think of when you do this. But okay, so the question with gagging, again, uh, I think gagging has to do with mouth breathing. And so uh, what can you do? Um, we've tried that. We've put it, we said, well, try a breathe right and, and so on. And whatever works. If they, there are patients, I'm sure, that you can't do it. They gag too bad. So you don't do it on everybody. Okay. Medical history. Letter of referral and a diagnosis of medical necessity. The, meta, the letter of referral says, please treat my patients for obstructive sleep apnea. In my opinion, this treatment that you offer, oral appliance, is a medical necessity. That, that seems to be the trump card. And then they need a previous sleep study, and you want a copy of that when you send in the form. And then they want a comprehensive written history uh, is, is important, too. But they have some comorbid symptoms. And then the other thing we have to do is to rule out acute problems. So um, you're looking at an x-ray here. We're looking at a um, patient. Um, so can we all see? that um, there's an obstruction, looks like an obstruction here. So the point is, would you, what do you do? You see this patient, um, would you make an oral appliance for this patient? Okay, the answer is no, you wouldn't make an appliance for this patient. Why wouldn't you make an appliance for this patient? Because if you have the right history, this patient is actually was a cleft palate. And so to keep this patient from uh, talking, to talk properly, they sewed the soft palate at the uvula to the back of the throat. And so the patient can talk properly, but you can't make this patient an oral appliance because the, the palate, soft palate is attached to the uvula. At the uvula, the soft palate is attached to the back of the throat. So you, you have to have the history. And if you, don't, if you look at the x-ray without the complete history, you don't know that. But apparently that's the cleft palate. So, okay, get the history. Know what you're talking about. Know your patient. You all know this stuff. Sleep, go back. Get a microphone to him. Alan, look at the sinus on the left side. Yes. Any comments? Yes. Looks cloudy to me. When, what about you? Is that relevant to whether you treat? Uh, no. Is that relevant to whether you treat? The, no. To treat whether you would treat this patient with an oral appliance, I wouldn't. I no, it's not that. relevant. Okay. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on these. Look at the difference in the size of the of the nasal airway on the right and the left. So what do we think is going to happen when this guy's nasal cycle flips over and he's on the left side? Is he going to be able to breathe? Is he liable to be able to snore? And that's another thing. So patients, that with the, we can't correlate the nasal cycle to a metabite test yet either. This is, again, it's complicated stuff. Okay, sleep-related history. Snoring. And snoring, we've got to have frequency of the snoring, the loudness of the snoring, and the effect on the sleep of others. They did a study at Rush University, and they found that the sleep of the uh, bed partners was affected as much the health of the bed partners was affected as much by snoring of, the, of someone else as it was if they were the snorer. So sleep-related history, daytime drowsiness. Uh, are, are you refreshed? You awake feeling refreshed. And uh, uh, what's the effect of your sleep on your daily activities? Can you perform your daily activities every day? Do you need a nap in mid-afternoon? Do you need a nap at any time of the day? Do you, you noticing any cognitive impairment? And do you have a history of motor vehicle accidents or near misses? And so uh, that, that question, if you ask that question of a you know, bus driver or truck driver, they're going to tell you, no, never have a problem. It's not like they come in admitting that because they know they're going to get their license pinched. And then it depends on certain, certain states you actually have a legal obligation, if you hear that, to write a report. So you've got to be careful. Sleep-related history, quality of the sleep, the number of times you wake up during the night, do you fall back to sleep easily? Do you ever awaken gasping or choking? Has anyone ever seen you wake up gasping or choking? And then what's your usual sleep position? Do you snore in all positions or do you snore only on your back? 
And then we have additional information. How many hours a night do you sleep? Do you have high blood pressure? Um, do you ever wake with a morning headache? Do you awake with a sour taste in your mouth? Do you ever have uh, regurgitation during your sleep from your acid regurgitation? That's called, uh, uh, hmm? pardon? Acid reflux. And <laughs> the word wasn't coming. Uh, and so the, the thing is, do you ever have that? Well, with the acid reflux happens more with apneic patients because when, when you saw the picture of that person, <coughs> they're actually, the, 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 the um, what do you call it? paradoxical breathing, they're, they're, they're actually forcing the stomach acid contents past the esophageal valve into the throat. And people who have that have an increased rate of pancreatic cancer also. So profound effects to some of this stuff, dry mouth, temporal mandibular joint symptoms, bruxism, excessive daytime sleepiness, change in weight, nasal congestion. We've talked about most of these now. So history of previous sleep disorders evaluation. And it's, it's interesting. Um, Common, common. It's, we just saw a guy the other day, 89 years old. He comes in, he had a sleep study five years ago. Uh, talked to me for consult. He's ready for an oral appliance. Maybe. Needs another consultation. The, the point is that 10 years. So I had a sleep study. Bring in your most recent sleep study. You look at things, 10 years. They live with this for 10 years. So you got a 10 year old sleep study. Are you going to send that in and say they need an oral? Yes because they've been diagnosed. This is a condition that doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. So if they got the diagnosis, 10 years old, you send it to the insurance company, they're very happy because they don't have to pay for another study and they've got it. I mean, it's, they, everybody knows it's not going to go away. So I see the 10-year-old study. We'll send it in, right, Gore? Yeah. So bring it. if you've got a 20-year-old study, I'll take it. I mean, it's just because we know the condition doesn't go away. They just, a lot of times, or they, 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 you know, they treating it with a CPAP, or they hated the CPAP, and sitting under the bed for one reason or another. Once you have that uh, um, previous study, previous diagnosis, they're good to go. Um, OK. There's the Epworth sleepiness scale. You've got it in your records more than once here. If you want it, print it out. The point is a 0 to 7 score, it's unlikely that you're abnormally sleepy. 8 to 9, you have an average amount of sleepiness. And 10 to 15, you are excessively sleepy. But, and you may want to consider medical attention. 16 to 24, it's like they'll probably fall asleep before the end of the Epworth test. <laughs> so you are excessively sleepy. At Rush Medical School, they do a one-hour intake. And it's, it's just amazing how many patients fall asleep during the intake. They say, OK, you got a problem here. Um, Bed partner's history is important. Do they have excessive movement during their sleep? Uh, a lot of times they'll come in as a new patient with the spouse, with the bed partner. And so you, you take the history from both. Never let them sit in the waiting room if you can, because you can get valuable information from the sleep partner. So excessive movement during sleep, snoring, cessation of breathing. Do they ever stop breathing? Do they ever catch them gasping for air? Do you hear them grinding their teeth? And then Gloria's been running around measuring necks all weekend. And so the point is, neck size is important. There is a correlation. Uh, men over 17 and women over 15 and a half, there's a way higher correlation. These people have more apnea than not. Always amazing when you see them come in and they have it. Patient examination. So we do a TMJ. You saw how we did a TMJ. We palpate lateral to the joint. We palpate in, in, in external auditory meatus. We auscultate. I, I feel. I would put my fingers here and feel. Um, stethoscope, OK. Um, Doppler, OK. But uh, do they have joint noses? I don't think you need any sophisticated equipment to find that out. And then you, we do the muscle palpation. You saw that. We do a range of motion. How wide can you open? 40, 49 millimeters is the magic number. More than that's hypermobile, under that's restricted mobility. And the normal is uh, greater than 8 millimeters laterally or protrusive. I usually don't see a full 8. But yeah, you see, and so you could say a lot of people are hypermobile, especially young women. 
temporal mandibular joint. We do the range of motion scale. That was the thing I used. And uh, so then we do a patient exam. The patient exam uh, consists of study casts and radiographs. Panoramic gives you a lot of good information. As I say, I don't think everybody has to go out and buy an iCat. There's information in an iCat that's good. Um, helps me. I, I, I not in the business of selling it to everybody, as you know. So when we do the cone beam, what we do look at are the TMJs, the oral airway, the nasal airway, and the pharynx. An apneic event, we said, is created by uh, two things, the muscle flaccidity, the negative pressure, or a combination of both, and we have muscle fatigue apply, figuring into this, and it, certainly the muscle fatigue can result from clenching with, and then the central nervous system misfiring, incoordination, pulmonary diseases, and neuromuscular diseases. You're obviously going to know this when they come in, if they, you know, have these problems. Um, so in the tonsillar grading score, when you see a four, that they call those kissing tonsils. And uh, so um, the, uh, to me, it hasn't been difficult to get tonsils and adenoids out in children. If you see tonsils and adenoids like this or like this, and, uh, and it's a mature adult, it's going to be difficult. Um, the tonsils, the surgery is doable. Uh, but they corm, and so the point is that they're, they're very close to carotid artery, and so they don't like to do it. They do as little tonsillectomy. It's a very painful procedure. It's a bloody procedure. They don't like suturing it. They're always worried about that, too, so they use chemicals that smell and taste horrible. Um, it's, it's, again, it's a scary procedure. They have a high mortality rate doing it. So it's difficult, but I always ask, well, why? Why don't you take out more tonsils? Well, don't ask why. You come to us and you do grand rounds, Alan, and you look the subject up and report back to us on it. You do, you do grand rounds presentation. So I went to the literature and I looked tonsils and adenoids and asked sleep apnea. And I found that the guy that had the most to say about this was a guy by the name of Michael Friedman, who's an ear, nose, and throat guy. He's got a huge practice and he's here in Chicago, um, fairly close to... Uh, where we are here, not quite downtown, near north. And so I went to see him, and um, he does a little more unusual procedures to reduce the size of the tonsils without removing them. He does sort of ablations and all kind of radio frequency ablation, various things he does. Anyway, it was very interesting. So I met Michael Friedman. Well, Michael came up, they used to have the Malam Potty scale. And M Michael says, well, the malum potty is next to useless because uh, if you have to take the tongue and have them stick out the tongue to look back there, what you're seeing is irrelevant. What you want to look at in terms of is there room in the airway, the tongue has to be in the mouth. So he came up with the Friedman scale. And the Friedman scale, he just says, okay, open the mouth up and you leave the tongue in. And then when you look back there, you're seeing a picture, a better picture of what's happening. So in a Friedman scale, you tell them to leave the tongue inside the mouth, and you see you give them the same grading scale, one, two, three, or four. And if you, have, uh, uh, if you want to do a malum potty, you say, stick your tongue out, and maybe even use a two-by-two two to grab it. And you look and you see. And again, uh, what we said is you're looking at a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object. It's like taking a, a, a slice uh, along the side of the picture rather than even cross-sectional uh, as we see on a CAT scan. So it has relevance more to is a anesthesiologist can have an easy time intubating the throat rather than is it relevant to whether they can have a breathing problem. But again, it's just one of those other factors that you think about. And then, okay, diagnosis of a mouth breather versus a nose breather. We have the sniff test. So we went through the sniff test. The sniff test, take a breath as deep and fast as you can through your nose. If the nares constrict, there's nasally obstructed breathing. And then you have a situation like this. Take a breath as deep and fast as you can through your nose. Whoops, unilateral 
obstruction problem. And so let's look at this re instant replay in slow motion. Take a deep breath through your nose. Whoops, there it is again. And so the point that's interesting here is when you look at this patient, you see exactly what you expect to see. It looks like edge to edge or slight overlap. And look at the side that's got the nasally obstructed breathing was the side with the crossbite. So interesting? Sure. And so I asked the kind of question, what does that mean when he's mouth breathing? His mouth breathing like this to one half of his mouth? <laughs> I don't know. Well, they say, they say the mouth breather, his tongue is in the floor of the mouth, and the lips are draping in, so he has that happen. Why does it happen more on the one side than the other? Because it's nasally restricted, but it's only happening because he's mouth breathing. Okay, the interplay of mouth breathing on tongue and facial development. So here's a patient here we see. Does this patient have lower teeth? Are they only wearing their upper denture? Sorry, look at that face. That's, that's a, a, a micronastic mandible. And look at the overclosure. Look at the curvature here, the overlap. Look at the wrinkling here. And does this patient have a breathing problem? Look at the pooling, the venous pooling in the eyes. Look at the deviated septum. So you start to suspect problems. And then when you look at this patient, you'll see some point in the next two days you're going to see another case that's a long face. This is a short face. And so you look at the long face where you see the narrow nostrils and yeah, they're straining here, but the point is when you look at that patient, it's the same problem. It's just some get short face and some get long face. I guess genetics may have something to do with it, but anyway, this is short face. And so you see it from the side. And then here's another case here where we see um, overlap, overjet, so we have a micronathy in the mandible, but we also have crowding in the upper arch as well. So chances are this mouth is going to be open when the patient's breathing. Look at those cuspal inclinations. So then we have what we said was step plane of occlusion. We identified a slight step plane of occlusion in Jan yesterday, but let's talk about it. That's the step plane of occlusion. The front six, are higher than the posterior eight or ten. And so how does this happen? This happens because the tongue is sitting in here. And so this is a lateral tongue thrust dysphagia. This patient is going to see impressions of the teeth on the sides of the tongue, and they're going to swallow with their teeth apart. These teeth grew to their full genetic height. These teeth were suppressed in their vertical growth by the presence of a tongue sitting on top of them. That, that when this patient clenches their teeth together on the back teeth or when this patient closes in centric occlusion, there's no place for that tongue except to go back onto the airway. So these patients are going to have small airways at night that can cause apnea, but they're also going to have, with the right circumstances occurring, they're also going to have small airways during the day because they've got to put the tongue someplace. And so look at this. This is what you see. What goes into this space? The tongue. The tongue goes in there. There's the other side. Okay, so we do a patient exam. We look at the size of the tongue. We look for the scalloping of the tongue, the length of the soft palate, the size of the uvula, the tonsils, and we look for crowding of the oropharyngeal airway. And so we see the scallop lateral border of the tongue. That's what it looks like there. And this is... I was in a hasty mood to show a picture. You've all seen worse scalloping of the lateral borders, I'm sure. There it is on the other side. And then we have combination of dysphagia and macroglossia. So this is what I was talking about here. When I see the fissure of the tongue, this says to me, that's macroglossia. This person has to fold their tongue to get it in their mouth. And so when I see that to me, immediately I say, macroglossia. There's another one. You have obstructions in the throat, we have enlarged tonsils, we have pretty large uvula as well, but the point is what, what, what's really going on here? 
folding. They have to fold the tongue. When you see that fold of the tongue, okay, large palate and uvula. So can we expect this patient maybe snoring? Possibly. Red battered uvula, snoring. Again, folding of the tongue. Scalloped tongue, macroglossia, long uvula, and obstructed airway. Look at the stuff that's in that airway. And look at the, look at again, sides of the tongue, fold of the tongue. This is macroglossia, a lot of problems. Is there any doubt that this patient, is there any chance that this patient isn't going to be snoring? I don't think so. Bruxism. So we have two kinds of bruxism, tonic and clenching. This is abfractions, we all know this, and the abfractions are where the tooth actually bends, according to Gene McCoy, who published the original article out of San Francisco. And rhythmic, rhythmic is grinding, flat, worn down teeth. When you see this, that's rhythmic bruxism. When you see this, rhythmic. When you see this, rhythmic. Or this, same model. Okay, sleep bruxism, according to Gilles Levine, is a movement disorder of the masticatory system characterized by teeth grinding and or clenching. Palates, let's talk about palates. The roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. A narrow palate is going to result in a narrow nose. A narrow nose is going to be obstructed nasal breathing. Look at, there's the roof of the mouth, there's the floor of the nose. The roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. The wider the roof of the mouth, the less nasal obstruction, less nasal restrictive airway. Narrow palate means narrow nose, increased resistance to airflow. Nasally, nasally, obst nasal obstruction is compensated for by oral breathing. Oral breathing, in order to breathe through the mouth, you have to put the tongue, you have to lower the tongue to the floor of the mouth. And so here's an example of lowering the tongue <coughs> to the floor of the mouth. And it's interesting. Um, Gloria, we had this problem. We always have this problem. We say to the patient, put your tongue in the roof of your mouth. And this to her means the tongue is in the roof of the mouth. But this is a low tongue position. And sometimes, no matter what you say, we try and gimmick what Gloria now says. Uh, pretend you have peanut butter on your tongue, and you want to stick the peanut butter to the roof of your mouth. Right? Is that the way you do it? Do that. And you still get this happening. <laughs> but we try our best. Because the point is, when we look at this x-ray, what we want to see is, well, how does the airway relate? And, and we want to know, does the tongue fit in the mouth? Well, look at all the space we have in the mouth. And so the tongue has no place to go but back here. So we do that. And then, like I say with, with, with Jan yesterday, it would have been interesting. But it's not, it's not diagnostic. It's to say, OK, put your bite in, and let's see what we did. And so often with the bite in tongue in the roof of the mouth, you say, oh, wow, look at that. You can drive a truck through that airway now. Does that mean it's going to work like that? Usually, but again, we haven't discovered the holy grail yet. Okay, here's another one. Oh, this is a very interesting x-ray. So low tongue position, long soft palate, reduced airway, severe curvature of the neck. So here's a guy, and he comes in, and he's got apnea. So you could think, well, maybe an oral appliance is going to help. But then again, it's not the tongue dropping back. It's the airway curving in the spinal column, impinging on the airway. This is Irv Cate. And so it's, it's, it's interesting because he's tried oral appliances, and they don't work. And so why didn't they work? He's CPAP's the only answer for him. Because the curvature is such here that, look at that, it's not even macroglossia. It's, Impingement of the spinal column and the airway, but the curvature is huge. And you're going to see these people that have that curvature, and so you have to look for it. Look at that curvature here. 
That's, all, that's, a, that's a cool giveaway. And then this looks like, oh, is that so terrible? Look at that. That's having to breathe through a drinking straw. Okay. So we see this here. Uh, low tongue position, reduced airway space. But again, it looks like it's small here, but you see the tongue that low, and you could put the tongue, and they could put the tongue up there. What it's about is, we have this narrow palate, the tongue doesn't always fit up there. And so this may be a truer picture of what you get. And so now you say, oh, well, maybe they have this reduced because of the uh, narrow palate. And then, but look at, look at, that's still a tough airway to breathe through because it's so small. Okay, and here's another one. Look at the size of that airway. And here's a case of a step plane of occlusion upper and lower. And here's again. This, this is, patient is biting on their second molars. So what you have is uh, dysphagia. The tongue is preventing these teeth from growing in. Tongue doesn't, not enough room in the mouth for the tongue. It has to go between the teeth. Okay, so here's another one. Tongue can't fit in the mouth. Mouth breather. Cheeks are draping in. Mouth is open. Low tongue position. Low tongue position. Same thing again. Look at all the different varieties of form that comes in. Look, here's the guy here who's taking a panoramic x-ray. And look at, he's biting on his back teeth. He can't put a tab in the front of his mouth. But also, okay, and then we saw... Another one, thumb or digit sucking versus propping. Proppers are mouth breathers, suckers are nose breathers. Here's the thing, you have two different things. You have a kid like this. Their neck has got circumoral um, surrounding of the thumb. That kid's sucking the thumb, and you're gonna see a welt on the thumb here where the kid sucks the thumb. And that kid is, in order to suck the thumb, he has to be nose breathing. I don't see that that's so terrible. I'd rather not have it. But that's nipple substitute. Okay, mouth is shut. Now, here's the one I'm worried about. He's got his blanket up here, or she. And the thumb is a prop to keep the mouth open. And so you can only see chapped finger, real badly chapped uh, digital uh, finger to palm. And uh, the point is you'll see this kid. And so, uh, maybe I can hear. There you go. This is thumb propping. And this is thumb sucking. Look at the way that thumb is. This kid is breathing through the nose. This kid is breathing through the mouth. So, or this kid's faking it, maybe. But the point is, this kid's face is too pretty to be a long face or short face. Okay, here's what it looks like when you see it. So now you see these patients as an adult. Okay. Insert, they should come with a manual. Insert thumb or finger here. Right there. And so, what do you see this here? This maxillary step plane of occlusion. This, they pull that out, and push the lower in, and we have a... Okay, here. Thumb propping. Look at that. You see it. And, and so, it's a cast on an adult. What do you think happened to this adult? This is something that could have been prevented in a child. We'll talk about that on Sunday. Okay, axillary mandibular step plane of occlusion. Look at, we have a step plane of occlusion in both. What's in here? The tongue, dysphagia. There it is, okay. Functional problem causing a retronathia and reduced tongue space. And then we have the case of iatrogenic micronathia. So when you see this, and you see four bicuspid extraction, somebody took away this much face from this guy, and this is the face where the tongue should be, and so where is he going to put the tongue? The tongue is going to be back in the throat here because he can't keep his tongue where it belongs. Not only is this a bad condition physiologically, this guy doesn't look so good. He's a handsome, buff guy. This guy could look so much better. So what are we going to do? Orthodontics, expand the palate, put in four implants and get this guy. He's got to be sick to do that. The people don't get motivated that much. So, but this is something that's avoidable and shouldn't happen. And it's our responsibility. It's our mandate not to do it, 
and to see that it doesn't get done. Bicuspid extraction reduces room for the tongue. Do we reduce the size of the tongue? Of course not. We expect a normal sized tongue to fit into a smaller space. The tongue has no choice but to go back and collapse on the airway. Okay, then we have cone beam tomography. We can look at sinuses, airways, TMJ, soft palate, and tongue position. Real quickly, so here's a very small, this is what a very small oral airway looks like. This is what we say again. This is like having to breathe through a drinking straw. You can see what it looks like here. And then in addition to that, you can also see the presence of tonsils in the adult. So bear in mind that if you see this, this is a very small airway. And then here's a very large airway. Look at the size of, by comparison of that airway here, wide open, wide open, epiglottis, wide open, uvula, palatal glossal fold. And again, we look at it here, tonsils. Small airway. Well, um, okay. When we take these x-rays, sometimes we used to take them with a tab in there so we see what the condyles look like beautifully. Then I decided really the condyle isn't important to look at. I, I converted from a TMJ to a sleep doc. I have them close the mouth now because more important for me to know how much space is there in the mouth for the tongue. And what does the airway look like with the tongue inside the mouth is more important than what the condyles look like. So I changed my position for these x-rays to biting on a tab in the front to close mouth. And so this is an older one where he had the closed mouth. But again, look at that. It's tough to breathe through that. Can you imagine this patient falling asleep, little flaccidity, boom, collapse. Look at the size of that airway. Very small. And here's a normal size airway. And look at, in that normal size airway, look at, look at where we are. We're, but look at this, look at this tonsils. There's no wonder what they can do. But still, not bad because of how wide it is. And it, Richard, this is the same old, same old. What are the consequences of that? You can ask an ENT what the consequences of that. And they don't, sometimes they bother them, sometimes they don't. Are these infected? Who knows? Uh, do these have to be removed? Who knows? So if the patient says, oh, I have horrible sinus problems, say yes, go see your ENT. Nah, I don't have any sinus problems. Okay. But sometimes you see these like this. And here, this, this sinus here, completely obstructed from two different planes. It's like there's no sinus. What's the function of sinuses in the human head? They don't know. Maybe reduce the weight of the head. Yeah, because we've got to balance the head on the spinal column. Exactly. Exactly. And so, and that's theory. That's theory. That's true. Okay. Clogged sinus. Different sinus. Ethmoid sinus. Clogged ethmoid sinus. Small airway, appliance in place. Tongue in the roof of the mouth. Look what happened. Look at the airway. Look at the airway. This is the patient said, thank you for giving me my life back. <laughs> you can imagine what it was before. Well, we showed you the picture before. It was the smallest, smallest one. But the point is, it's, this is not always predictable information. Restricted. Consul's patient is 26 years of age. But look at that airway. Soft palate blocking the airway. Look at this. Here's the soft palate. Here's the uvula. Is that uvula interfering? It looks like it is. But, and even here, look, it looks like, almost looks like a tumor in the side or a tonsil is there and one isn't. This is interesting stuff. Huh? This is why they need mouth guards. This is the lead-in. I should be talking about mouth guards because there's two types of trauma. This kind of trauma here. When this kind of trauma hits, guys wearing a football helmet, the brain, when it's hit like this, bangs 
the brain goes faster, bangs the skull on this side, and bruises itself. That's, that is a concussion, and there's a bruise. However, when you have this concussion, this is temporal lobe concussion. This is the temporal lobe of the brain. When this thing, jaw going, is, goes up into the fossa, it's, it's the condyle mushing the brain. That's serious. That's different. Question? So, yeah. How often do you see that? I've never seen that. That CT. So, you see football players? You see... Yes. Okay. You never saw that? N well, I don't have CT, obviously, but I've never seen that. This is a 33-year-old woman who was asymptomatic. Well, you need... Well, okay. Wait a minute. Just because... I, I don't want to denigrate your statement, but if you don't have the CT, how are you going to see it? But this is from bruxism or from trauma? No. Trauma. I, I, this I would, unequivocally trauma. Okay. How else does that happen? Often. Well, all, that's going to happen mean, besides trauma? Trauma happens often, yes. I don't see that that can happen from anything but trauma. We got a disc up there. Right. The disc has to get knocked out of place, and then the jaw has to go into the brain and do the brain damage. Okay. And so that's, that's, that's the... Um, so that's the reason why, we talk, to me, when you talk about concussion protection with a mouth guard, that's what we're talking about. And there's two types of trauma. There's two types of concussions. Temporal lobe trauma, where the condyle goes in and mushes the brain through the top of the, temper, the, the glenoid fossa. And the glenoid fossa here, look at it. It's paper thin. This can happen. Yes, you got something, Richard? Yeah, but it's paper thin. It's, it's less than a half a millimeter. Okay. Under normal circumstances. Okay. And so, but the point here is that this happens, and this is, a, this is most likely the event of trauma. And because she was asymptomatic, that doesn't, we don't know when this happened either. But the point is, this is why we talk about preventive mouthpieces. The idea that these guys are wearing helmets and that they get hit like this, there's nothing we could do to get them hit like this. They could put what? Airbag in? They could, put, they could put an airbag in there, in the helmet, but it's not the airbag that's going to prevent the brain from hitting the skull on the opposite side. That's going to happen. And so the thing, the thing that they're talking about now that might do that is they're talking about putting in a, 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 a trans, uh, what do they call it, Rick? A trans, uh, in a, in a um, transducer, impact transducer, so that they can measure the size of the impact, and then if, a, if they could, so a guy gets in a traumatic thing in an NFL game, and they take him out and they say, let me see the helmet, and they put the helmet on a, on a, uh, a, a viewer or a special m machine, and they read the impact of the trauma. They say, ho, oh, that, you, you're out. You had a concussion, and that may work. But um, the other thing that we're talking about is putting one of those in a mouthpiece you know, so you can measure the impact of the jaw. But, uh, yeah, these have a role. But this here, that's, it's this trauma here. And so you take a football player, you take, and, and, and they're wearing a helmet. And what's their helmet doing? That helmet's got a chin strap like iron. And if they're not wearing their mouthpiece, that helmet is setting them up for that trauma. That's setting them up for that. When they have that chin concussion, and, and what are the symptoms? Those are very, very specific symptoms. Those symptoms are when they say, I got my bell rung. I saw stars. I saw stars. I got my bell rung. Start looking for this. Because they're doing, that's serious brain damage. Yes, Richard. This is the guy that, this is the player. When you see that, that's the one whose careers, two or three of these in their careers, you know, I mean, these are the guys retiring when they're 28 instead of 36 because they're not functioning. These are the guys committing suicide. I mean, this is different stuff. The literature says that most of the time, that bruise goes away. They can see the bruise on a PET scan, and it goes away. That doesn't mean it doesn't do damage. Yes, sir? Superior portion of the glenoid fossa, will it heal? I mean, you unload it, and will it heal? Will it come back, the bone? I don't know. What do you think? I think it has potential. Okay. The reason I hesitate is because she had no, she absolutely denied a history of trauma. So I'm thinking, okay, you fell out of the wagon when you were seven years old, eight years old. Okay, 
But it's not like your boyfriend hit you three weeks ago in the chin and banged your brain and your condyle into your brain. She's in total denial of that. So I say, okay, all right. So, uh, and again, so we're now talking about pro professional mouthpieces and how to fit it. And so <laughs> here's the message, take home message here. The take home message is that an ideal mouth guard can increase performance. I'm reading the sign off the back there. It, it helps the, pay, the user to breathe better. It offers concussion protection. It's comfortable. You can talk with the mouthpiece in place, and you can drink with the mouthpiece in place. And so this is where mouthpieces are going. The mouthpiece is going to look just like that. And the fact is that what I'm saying to you is the most logical way, there's a brochure in there, in your, in your holder, folder, the most logical way to take the, to record the maxillomandibular relationship for that device is exactly what we did for the Moses. So what I'm hoping is the take home message is you got more income generating possibilities if you could think about doing mouthpieces on athletes to prevent concussion, to increase performance, to increase breathing, or increasing performance. And are we increasing neurological performance? Of course we are, because we get facilitation of the whole nervous system. And so that's uh, the, the, the simple message. And now, as a result of that little discussion that I almost forgot, thank you, Gloria, you have double the income producing properties from the lesson you got here on how to record the bike. So Modern is making these right now, but they're pretty expensive, and I'm, so I'm looking for a lab. I'm very close to finding a lab. Modern, this Boma charge is 220 for that, and uh, Modern is going to, I'm, I'm negotiating with a lab that's looking at about 110. So as soon as I do that, if you email me or if you, I got your emails, I'll, I'll let you know if you have any interest in doing that. Um, and and the, big, the big issue now is we're working on color. And so if you want to see what we're doing for color, and if you want to see what they look like, um, this is the athletic mouth guard. We've got one here in green. We've got a couple in red and blue up there. And we'll pass them around. Good. OK. OK, and so there's what it looks like on the perforation of the glenoid fossa inside the skull. Here's what it looks like from the side. There's another picture of it close up. And then here's a, interesting also, these are asymptomatic TMJs. And so Mike and I, we went and took these to Jim Williams. We said, what is, what's going on here, Jim? Remember? He gave it a name, and I forgot the name, but it's not the <laughs> Rick and Glory and I wrote on the condyles, which you have the reprint on, on variation in condylar angles. It's in your thing there that I showed you the results of the slide, why we said the jaw usually in protrusion goes to one side or the other. So we had a little more doubt about that because I felt that was a very controversial article. And so I thought, Okay, when the letters to the editor come in, I'm thinking, what can they say so I can be ready? Because you get, when they give you a letter to the editor for a journal, you've got about three days, four days to answer it, and the window closes because they have another edition to get out. So I figured, let's anticipate the problems. And so what happened was uh, Mike and I went to see Jim Williams, and I said, look, it, just because the condyles are asymmetric, does that mean the eminence is asymmetric? Because maybe the condyles, the eminence is going to be the opposite. And maybe with the eminence in the opposite direction, it can still go straight out. And so I thought, what's the letter to the editor? So I went to see him. We went to see him. We said, hey, help us here. What do you think the argument's going to be? And the guy says, if you get an argument, I'm writing the letter back. What you say is right. I go, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, it was worth our while to come. Let's do a couple of other problems. <laughs> so we had a good time with him because he, did, he validated what we said, and it was nice. But th this is fun stuff, and it's all fun stuff we're doing, and I just have a nice resource. Okay, so that's called OCD. Osteochondritis desiccans. 
Okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. Right. Maybe. He, uh, he, he, had a, he had a name, too. But it's, again, you see the condition, you just give it a name. It doesn't mean you biopsied it. But, it's, but he felt that this was not pathological. But again, so we're ready to go back again, and we'll show him again. And he will have done some work on it. His guy's been an interesting guy. He loves that. We love afternoons like that. He does, too. Okay, panoramic x-rays. Real quick, real quick. So on a panoramic x-ray, you can see nasal obstruction, deviated septum, broken nose, gonial notching, and a sinus problem with some dysphagias. So, okay, this looks sort of normal because you get a nice nose, but then you still have something growing in the sinus here. Otherwise, condyles, everything looks good. This is a panoramic x-ray. It looks okay. And so then you see in a panoramic x-ray, this is a very narrow nose. And so that's what we see. There it is again. And then... You can also see, these are interesting, it's a very narrow nose, but there's something growing in there. We call these concretions. This is, that's, that's actually the official defined word, but a concretion is a softer structure than the bone itself, but it's hard enough that it shows on an x-ray, and uh, it obstructs the airway. Sometimes it's due to trauma, but again, okay, that's the story. So we see concretions, re severely restricted nasal airway. Here's, again, Looks like no nasal airway, restricted nasal airway. And here's another one. And so you see, whoop, where's the septum? Where's this, what's going on in this nose? And so when you see this kind of a thing, this is the one where you've got to ask, especially if it's a woman, are you a victim of abuse? Have you been a, 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 a battered? Have you been, you know, because this is what happens when the nose is repeatedly beat up. There it is. This is a broken nose. Broken nose. Boom, boom, boom. Broken nose. You can see these things. They stand out. They hit you in the head. And does that affect? Yes, because look at the size of the airway here compared to the size of the airway here. And the other thing is that when this thing touches here, if, if this is not really completely set, this is where the pain happens. This is where they get the sinus headaches. Same thing here. Broken nose. Broken nose again. This is a one. Favorite one, this one came in, and we sewed the x-ray. You got a broken nose. Well, she said had a fit. She just absolutely went ballistic, took the x-ray, ran out of the office, came back a little while later and said, you know, I had a skiing accident. I ran into a tree. I took it next door to the Michael Reese medical facility, and they took three x-rays and couldn't see it. So I looked at the x-rays, and they didn't have as good a machine. They, they used the Caldwell. They, did, they didn't have it. It wasn't there. So it's not like it was malpractice, but if you see it, you call it to their attention. She wanted this fixed. She couldn't breathe out of the right side, the left side of her nose here. Yeah, she couldn't breathe out of the left side of her nose. It bothered her tremendously. Okay, broken nose and concretions. There they are, bigger. Okay, edentulous collapse, you all know this one. And so the point is that these patients can have apnea. Is their airway going to be restricted by their tongue? Yes. Here's the difference. Look at this patient got a problem? Is this is this did we make more room for the tongue in this airway on the right? Of course we did. Okay. So the dentist referring doctor. Oral cancer screening is a recognized standard of care. The dentist is looking at the relevant structures. He merely needs to be instructed in BMI, tonsillar grading score, neck size, and to ask, do you have excessive daytime sleepiness? Do you ever awake gasping or choking? Does your sleep partner complain of your snoring? Ask those questions. That's the answer. That's our take-home message. And then the dentist is referring to doctor. We're already taking the medical history as a recognized standard of care. We're already querying if they're diabetic. We're already asking if they're depressed. We're already asking, do you have a high blood pressure, heart problem, and what your medications are? The dentist knows if you're on drugs such as modafinil, benzodiazepines, uh, Ambien, or antidepressants such as Prozac, Zoloft, or tricyclics. We know if they're on these things. All we got to do is look it up if you don't even remember. The dentist should be encouraged as a primary screener and referral source for patients with sleep disordered breathing. Clinical features alone cannot identify obstructive sleep apnea. Prediction models are not accurate enough. Polysomnography, standard of care. But we do have excellent polysomnographs available for us. Okay. Any questions? You have questions? Yes. Get her a microphone, quick. 
Um, I would like to ask you, um, did you, can you point out cases in which you decided not to make an oral appliance in regard of your examination of the TMG? Excuse me, say it again. Can you point out case or cases when you decided not to make an oral appliance uh, in regard to your examination no, of the TMG? No, I will not point that out. I can't point that out. Mm -hmm. I don't use degenerative joints as an excuse to not make an appliance. I will make an appliance because the appliance that I make for sleep apnea is so similar to the appliance that I make for jaw problems that I feel that I'm helping to solve the jaw problem as well. The reason I take all this information is not to not do it. It's because when I do it, I can demonstrate that I didn't do any harm, that they didn't get worse. I don't want, I don't want some of these patients coming in a year later, if I don't have the records, to say, you know, I heard right here and I have a jaw problem and you did it because I take an extra, oh yeah, you have a little jaw problem. Okay, but you also had the jaw problem two years and it was just as fine. It may even been better or, you know, worse when I started and it's better now. So I don't use that as ever as an excuse not to treat a jaw problem. I just know what I'm getting myself into before I start. I would treat that as a what do I treat a jaw problem or how do I bill it on insurance? I'm going to bill it as a sleep problem because they pay better on insurance. If I see a TMJ case today, there's very few of them that go home without a metabyte study because, I, first of all, I have to know. Uh, and, and if I bill it, and, and okay, in the United States, if I bill it as a, a sleep problem, it's more likely to get paid. It's more important. If I bill it as a TMJ and give the impression that I overlooked the sleep problem, that's negligence. That's not appropriate standard of care. So most TMJ patients get a sleep study, a home sleep study with a metabite. Now, if I have, let's say, a AHI of 40, am I going to treat the sleep problem with an oral appliance? Probably because I'm going to call the physician and say, listen, give me, I'm going to treat this, give me four weeks, give me six weeks before we address the um, breathing problem. Let's see what the oral appliance does. We may want to use CPAP in a conjunction with the oral appliance. We don't want to neglect the jaw problem and oral appliance. So, so I still wind up doing it. I always do it. But I, I, the more information you got, the better your decision-making possibilities. Do you have a question? You're agreeing? Yes. Good.